So we're uh, getting to hopefully pick up the pace here a bit. I think that we're all more or less similar background, at least historically speaking up to this point. Now we'll try to pick up any uh, things we need here uh, from Eusebius as we move along. Okay, so uh, it's always useful to look at introductions in terms of uh, Eusebius as that is, not other people perhaps. And we get some idea of his idea. He's reviewing the Old Testament here about the Son of God and God. And uh, uh, in any case, um, you see, it's aimed at the Roman Empire. Even his introduction is aimed, even though this is late in the life of the Roman Empire. You know, the Hebrew law only goes so far. Now we have Greek and Roman laws that have improved it. And that's why people weren't ready for the message of the Christ. So right off, as you see, the aiming is towards the Greco-Roman world. Um, and uh, the main thing that's being pulled from the Judaic Hebrew one is this idea of a world ruler or a messiah, which they may even have inherited from the Zoroastrian world. I'm not even sure where they got that idea. Because there's only a few passages in Jewish scripture that even, you know, allude to such a conceptuality of a world ruler of some kind. And there's basically one prophecy about that in Numbers 24, and it's even ascribed to a foreign prophet, Balaam. Um, but anyway, it's not a highly developed Hebrew notion until this period of the second century. B.C. onward. So Daniel, as he mentions, is the prophet that speaks about the thrones being placed, the ancient of days set, and this accords with our translation of Daniel even at the present time, the wheels burning, and the, he saw one coming, and the clouds, and this is very important, that looked like a son of man, but, you know, it wasn't the son of man coming on the clouds ever, and even you see this doesn't uh, translate Daniel saying the son of man. Meaning one like a son of man in Daniel, I covered that in my uh, Daniel class recently. His appearance was as a man. Son of man means a man. In Hebrew, son of man and Aramaic means son of Adam. A descendant of Adam. That is not an angel, not a supernatural being. You know, the ancient mind had all kinds of different orders of being, something like a Japanese cartoon, where you have all these crazy, you know, huge super figures, warrior figures, different, um, different kind of generations of beings. But men were descendants of one man, Adam. And Adam in Hebrew and in these other languages, Aramaic, means man. That's what Adam means, man. And uh, son of Adam is son of man. And in scripture particularly, I think what happened is certain Greeks or Helen, Greek speaking Hellenized people who, from whom the scripture as we are familiar with it seems to have uh, descended, got the, ocean, got the notion that this was a Hebrew concept meaning the son of man. There is no anywhere any, any mention of the son of man. It isn't. Uh, 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 the problem was from Daniel, and the fact that Daniel, I think, was written in, in Aramaic, uh, not even in Hebrew. And it was elsewhere in Daniel, as I discussed in my other class, there's actually a passage where the angel meets da Daniel and says to him, Oh, son of man. This is what you must say. In other words, Daniel is the son of man because he's not an angel. The angel isn't the son of man. The angel looks like a son of man. He has the appearance of a son of man, but he's actually not a son of man. He only looks like a son of man. The person Daniel that he quotes here is a famous passage described on the clouds who looks like a son of man, has the appearance of a man. But obviously if he's on the clouds, he's not a man. Except in the modern space age. This is a, a basic misconception, I think, of gone into the New Testament. And so Jesus is, you will see the Son of Man doing this, that, and everything else, as if this is, so, to me, that immediately shows us that those are not eyewitness accounts, because I'm sure Jesus never referred to himself as the Son of Man. And uh, it's just somebody who's putting words in Jesus' mouth who doesn't understand the concepts.
and has mistaken the vision in, in uh, Daniel for a specific the rather than a more generalized A. And that, uh, it, it, it immediately identifies it as not being written by uh, or not being said by someone in Palestine who would have known these things and he would have been laughed at uh, for saying such things uh, in a Palestinian environment at that time. Because, well, you haven't read Daniel properly if you're calling yourself the son of man. There's no, there's, there's no, you want to call yourself the Messiah? Why? You want to call yourself some other thing of that kind? The righteous one? Fine, but you can't call yourself the son of man. Uh, there isn't such a concept. Not in Palestine. In Greek, uh, in Greek translation, they may have developed that. Uh, Ezekiel is the best place to look for that. That's the first place I know where the concept is used. And if you look at chapters 38, 39, 37, how many have read e Ezekiel, the prophet? He's someone you shouldn't read. Uh, he's a great, great prophet. In my mind, probably the greatest single piece of literature in the Old Testament. Maybe, I think, even better than Isaiah, because Isaiah is a composite work. Uh, probably three different authors involved in the writing of it, where Ezekiel is a single author and uh, splendid as splendid can be. Okay, we're way beyond ourselves. Let's go back to what we're talking about. So he's talking about here the prophet Daniel, and as you said, this is a pseudepigraphic work. And you see how important the prophet Daniel was to these people? Let's go on. It's now the proper place, chapter 3, where we can begin, to show the very name of Jesus was also the Christ, was honored by the pious prophets of old. Now there Eusebius is showing off his knowledge of Hebrew. Eusebius is writing in the 300s. He was originally the bishop of Caesarea on the Palestinian coastline. Uh, so he came from Palestine. He's not a Jewish person from Palestine. Jewish life has been disrupted ever since the uprisings in the, in the first century. Uh, if you want a map here, I think I'm given a map here, but here's the map. There's the Dead Sea. Here's Jerusalem. Caesarea is here. It was a vast town built. Guess who, guess who built that town? Herod. And why did he name it Caesarea? Oh, usual sycophantish activity of playing up to his uh, patrons, naming cities in Palestine after them. So he named this city after Caesar. Uh, so you see, this comes from Caesarea on the coast in the 300s. By this time, it is settled down, I'm sure. And he knows some Hebrew. And he likes to show off his knowledge. He goes to Rome ultimately. He becomes somehow involved with them, future Emperor Constantine. He, he becomes his private uh, consultant, tutor, teacher, uh, alter ego, whatever. And he promotes uh, his form of Christianity in conscience, Constantine's mind. And Constantine uses Eusebius. I think Eusebius even has a life of Constantine that he wrote, another work of his, uh, to develop a uh, the form of Christianity that he likes in the Roman Empire, and you see this organized these various church councils, particularly the one at Nicaea, that really lays down in 325 what Christianity was to become in the Roman Empire, and what was considered to some extent heretical, and what was going to be considered orthodox. Um, that's another chapter you can read. Chapter 5. After the necessary preliminary to the ecclesiastical history which we have proposed to write, it now remains that we commence our course of invoking God the Father and Jesus the Christ, our revealed Savior and Lord, the heavenly Word of God as our aid. Well, that's straight doctrine as we know it even today. So he's already starting prefacing his account by total orthodox uh, presentation of what Jesus was thought to have been. And here he starts now. In the 42nd year of the reign of Augustus, and now he's going to quote heavily from Josephus, which is why I'm using this, because uh, he, he, he does bring things in. And uh, the 28th, from the subjection of Egypt and the death of Antony and Cleopatra, so he knows that uh, Egyptian uh, rule, and so he says, would terminate the dynasty of the Ptolemy, so he knows all that. And he knows the actual dates. When according to prophetic prediction, our Lord and Savior Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the same year when the first census was taken <coughs> and Quirinius was governor of Syria. So, and uh, Luke mentions, I have a footnote, this Quirinius of Cyrenius, which is true. That census, and now he goes into Josephus, is first mentioned by Flavius Josephus, the distinguished historian among the Hebrews, who adds another account respecting the sect of the Galileans. So already now he says 
that the Christians were called Galileans. So that's a really interesting little bit of information. And Galileans was not really a um, um, was not really a uh, geographical location as much as an ideological identification, which is interesting. So we're starting to get data, which he's picking up from different sources, and he immediately then jumps to Judas the Galilean, or Judas of Galilee, as he translates it here in my version, and the reference to Judas the Galilean in Acts 5.37. So he's, his mind is jumping all over, he's got a lot of data, and he's beginning to pour it out to us, and that's why we're going to read this, and try to get our own data from reading him. Not that we want to um, follow him, but trying to get a source of him data without studying the whole history in a different course. So by doing it the way he's doing it, culling important points, we can build up enough knowledge then to read the book of Acts and uh, Paul's letters and uh, find out what was going on in the early church and the origins of Christianity, I think, from that's how I would do it. Uh, now, right off the bat, this is wrong in a way. Because there are two accounts of the birth of Christ, and he just ignores the one that's at odds with this, doesn't he? As we said uh, last time, what's this other account? Matthew account. And Matthew does not have Jesus born at the time of the census, does he? So he only takes the one that's convenient for him. But we know the time of the census is 7 AD. He doesn't go into even the fact that 7 AD was not zero. So any problems he just sets aside. He's not interested in that. He wants only the positive spin that he can deal with things here. So yes, the, that's from the Gospel of Luke. And Acts was also supposed to have been written by Luke too. So we have two books based on Luke's uh, testimony that seems to have something to do also with Josephus' writings because occasionally Luke shows dependence here and there on Josephus' writings. So look at this. So. There was also a Galilean sect named after Judas of or the Galilean. Now he rightly quotes the whole passage from Josephus here on Judas the Galilean. And he shows us that Judas the Galilean did not come from Galilee, but came from Golan. The Golan Heights, as we now call it, which if you want to map, it's this area over here. So he rightly uh, makes it clear that that is where uh, Judas comes from. And the reason he's important is because he's mentioned in Acts. Now, what's interesting about the mention in Acts? <clears throat> what's interesting, as we'll see when we go back to it again when, when we read Acts, but we'll pick it up here too, the mention in Acts is a, um, an anachronism. The mention in Acts clearly has got the date wrong. Because it says, it mentions another character, Theudas, in the, uh, in the mention in Acts, I don't have my Acts with me at the moment, but uh, it says, and after Theudas came Judas the Galilean. All this material is from Josephus, because Theudas is mentioned in, in Josephus. Theudas is a revolutionary leader in around 44 AD who wants to take the people out of the country because of all the corruption and mess and, and the horrible situation that the situation wants to do the Moses Exodus in reverse. That is, he's a Joshua in reverse. He wants to cross the Jordan River and lead the people out instead of Joshua crossing the Jordan River and leading them in. He wants to part the Jordan River like Joshua. He's a magician. He's a uh, imposter. He's a pseudo messiah. He's a whatever you want to call him, a pseudo prophet. Josephus has various names for these troublemakers, and he doesn't like any of them. And Josephus wouldn't have liked Jesus either if he. Uh, put him in with these others. Because all these people who are giving signs and wonders, Josephus is really upset about. And Josephus says these pseudo-prophets, messiahs, uh, uh, postures as he calls them, uh, uh, are more dangerous even than the uh, bandits on the highways. Because they want to combine both revolutionary with religious change. And he says uh, what they're doing is showing them the signs of their in one case, in uh, the war, he says they're impending freedom. In the uh, antiquities, the later work, 20 years later, he says they're impending redemption. But anyway, Jesus portrayed not only in uh, John, but also in Matthew and Mark and, and Luke as doing these signs and wonders. And 
that accords with, particularly in the wilderness. So uh, this multiplying of loaves, for instance, not the marriage in Cana of Galilee, but the multiplying loaves in places like Jesus crosses the Sea of, of, of Galilee and he goes to a deserted place. It's a bit like the Udis wanting to cross the Jordan and go out into the wilderness and there to show them the signs of their impending freedom. So there Jesus shows the people the signs by multiplying the loaves and so on. So Jesus is portrayed in the scripture as one of these kind of people that Josephus is complaining about. That is someone who is leading the people out into the wilderness there to show them the signs. Now in Christianity it's not the signs of their impending freedom or their redemption, meaning freedom from the Romans and their redemption as a people, but he's showing them signs of his messiahship. To go back here, Judas, that's why I brought him up, in relation to this Judas the Galilean thing, is out of, out of context. So it says, after the Judas came Judas the Galilean. Well, that couldn't possibly be. So if you look at this passage in Acts, I can read it to you here quickly. Uh, what's, the, what's that chapter 5 in Acts? I have a, a New Testament here. But it's, chapter 5 is that he has there? Let's see, I'll read it to you quickly. It's supposed to be the, the Pharisee teacher Gamaliel talking. And these are put in, uh, Gamaliel's, uh, in, in Gamaliel's uh, words here. And he's protecting um, uh, uh, Paul, or Peter rather. He said at the Sanhedrin, Man, Israelites! Gamaliel talking at the Sanhedrin. Paul's teacher, uh, theoretically. Be careful what you are doing to these men. For before these days, the Udis rose up, boasting himself to be a somebody. And a number of men, about 400, were joined to him, and he was killed, and all of them were scattered. That's right out of Josephus, but that's 44 AD. And they came to nothing, as many were following him. And after this, Judas the Galilean arose in the days of the census, and drew away many people after him. And he also was destroyed, and all of them were scattered. And so something's wrong here, because this is not the proper order. Judas the Galilean doesn't come after, the, after the, he comes before him. But he's showing off his knowledge, the writer of this text. I guess that's not sure that this is not Gamaliel. The writer wants to show that he knows about the period, but in showing it, like all people who show off too much, he sometimes sticks his foot in his mouth and know you know where he's getting his information. If you look at Josephus in the antiquities carefully, you'll see that Josephus mentions Theudas, and he talks about Theudas very seriously, and the famine, which, by the way, then a prophet called... Um, Agabus goes down to Antioch and uh, proclaims the famine here in Acts. Josephus talks about the famine, so that comes right around the time of Theudas. Then he says, after that, the two sons of Judas the Galilean were crucified by the Romans. That Judas the Galilean, who rose up in the time of the census, and then he explains who Judas the Galilean was, after talking about the crucifixion of his two sons. You follow me? So that's 48 AD. So that is afterwards. But what's the author of Acts done? He in too hastily chucked away the crucifixion of the two sons and only retained the part about Judas the Galilean. So again, someone has done his work a little bit too sloppily, moved too fast. You see, that's what a scholar can do with it. Yeah, there is no sequence. Just read them as they are useful to you. And if there's nothing to read, don't bother. But if you want more material, then you go into some of those other things. You know, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, Josephus is always useful to read. The book that I wrote, The Dead Scroll from the First Christians. Okay, chapter 3 is my argument, my apology as I get it. The name of Jesus was known, so we did that, that he was called the uh, Joshua and so on. And um, he gets at the end of chapter 3 to um, a reference about a star. And you should know that at this time there was a prophecy uh, called the star prophecy. That is, uh, comes out of um, Numbers 24-17. A star will rise from Jacob, a scepter, to rule the world. I think it's... Uh, and we now know that that prophecy was very important to the people of Palestine in this period. So if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I'm very uh, much 
known for and fairly well versed in. That prophecy exists three times, at least even in the documents that have survived that we've found, in very important contexts. One context is in a document that's really quite important called the Damascus document. And it talks about, it quotes the prophecy, and then it talks about an interpreter of the law who's supposed to be the star, who's going to come to Damascus and uh, teach about the new covenant or whatever there. So it's very Christian-like in the sense that someone's coming to Damascus. Now, Paul comes to Damascus, according to Acts' portrayal of early Christian history, uh, but he's not an interpreter of the law in that he abolishes or denies the law. This person is supposed to, someone who reinforces the law according to the Matthew stuff. So it's like Acts, but it's kind of the opposite of Acts in this regard. And uh, many of us have called uh, the Damascus document a kind of opposition Acts. It's written very uh, uh, in a covert form. Nobody is identified. It uses uh, euphemisms and allusions and pseudonyms to refer to what obviously are some historical events. But one thing that comes clear very, very strongly, it's very pro-law, very pro-Moses, very pro-the covenant, very pro-purity regulations, very pro-separation of uh, holy from profane, as I've told you, and so on. And, and these are new documents. So now we have new Palestinian insight, and it's a messianic document. It's very interested in the messianic ideology. So these are new messianic documents from a different point of view than Acts. And I, I think we do have here basically an opposition to Acts. Uh, what's happening in Palestine from a different point of view. So I urge you to yeah, try to look at that. Uh, it's in the back of one of my books, Tennessee Scrolls and the First Christians, but you can get it in any collection of common documents. But I assure you, if you read it by yourself, you won't understand it. It took me about uh, five years of reading it with classes over and over and over again before I began to penetrate the weird veneer of its, uh, of its uh, presentation. In any case, it's in that. It's another document called the War Scroll, War of Sons of Light Against the Sons of Darkness. These, do titles, these documents don't have titles. We gave them the titles. But Sons of Light is a term known to certain books of the New Testament, John and others. And um, Paul knows about the terminology. And the scrolls, people are calling themselves obviously the sons of light. Everyone thinks they're the sons of light and the others are the sons of darkness. It's a little bit extreme. It's a holy war against all the sons of darkness on the earth, which is going to be helped by angels, angelic angels, and the angelic host that's going to join the sons of light on this earth and participate in this war. And this war is a messianic war because it's going to be led by the star, the, the, the Messiah. So that's very Christian, yet it's not Christian. Because it's a really overt war against darkness and evil on this earth, not in a supernatural heavenly sphere. So uh, there the star prophecy is quoted in total detail in order to explain what this war is going to be like and who's going to be leading it and, uh, and how it's going to be fought. And that's another document that's going on. So you see, we have a different kind of messianic movement here. We have a native Palestinian messianic movement. That's what people miss in the scrolls. You, you hear about the scrolls, and you hear all kinds of nonsense about the scrolls. It's been spun through a theological pattern. And just about all the scholars come from seminaries of some kind, Protestant seminaries, Jewish seminaries, Mormon seminaries, or, uh, or Catholic seminaries. We just don't have secular scholars doing this to the extent that we should, and now we're getting more, I hope, with state universities like this, and UC system and everything else, which don't have schools of theology attached to them. And the private universities almost all have theology schools attached to them. And the people who teach these subjects double within the theology school and in the, and so you're dead in the water in most of these places with getting a, a totally unfiltered view. Those people may be good, but they're still going to, they're going to deny their own theology? I don't think so. And they're still going to you know, go only so far and then stop. So that's one of the problems in this field of the people who um, work on. So this is a totally different messianism. Very aggressive, very militant messianism. Still messianism, star marks. 
Finally, you have a group of texts, I think it's called the Testimonia, but this is a collection of proof texts. A collection of proof texts that uh, are just like the kind of things that you'll get handed out by, you know, religious enthusiasts on campuses or elsewhere, listing the different texts that are supposed to apply to your time and place. And among the texts that are picked out are familiar ones that we sometimes even use today, but also the Star Prophecy. So we have three different uh, versions of the Star Prophecy. And finally, Josephus says, at the end of his war, when he talks about the omens that brought about the war against Rome, he says that in addition to all these omens, there was an odd oracle in the Jewish scripture that some interpreted one way, some interpreted another way, but which our young men were zealous for, that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. And all kinds of bad things happened to our people because of this oracle and the people who were zealous for it. Wars were fought and so on and so forth. And finally he says that the war against Rome was, was actually triggered or encouraged or based on this star prophecy. So the war from 66 to 70 that he's documenting was actually uh, motivated by the star prophecy on the Jewish side, which means that the warriors on the Jewish side were messianic warriors. Now, very few people see that quote in Josephus, but it is there. That's no wonder that the Romans then, who were picking up the star prophecy from their point of view, want to sort of uh, pacify this. Get rid of the militancy. Get rid of the aggressive warlikeness. I mean, uh, you know, we have this extreme situation in Palestine. A combination of religious national no, nationalism with extreme religiosity. And it's an incendiary situation, and the Romans aren't used to it. It's this ferocious national religious resistance that was very difficult for them. They finally overcame it, but with extreme brutality, and they fought it. For them. since 63 BC, not just to 66 to 70 AD, but even on to 136. But there were several uprisings that occurred even outside of Palestine, in Egypt, under Trajan, in North Africa, in Cyrenaica, Josephus tells us about that, and there were others around 115. Uh, all the Jews in Egypt were eradicated in 115, where we don't have a Josephus to tell us about this, because of the unrest and uh, revolutionary religious uh, activity that was going on there. They were literally wiped out as, you know, totally. And um, we just don't have a historian to tell us about what happened. We found it all in what are called the scrap heaps there, the ash pits, where we have the, the documents that have been thrown in, you know, sort of like piles of hieroglyphic rather papyrus uh, materials that relate to some of that kind of thing that went on in Egypt. And then in Palestine, once again, you have a last uprising from 132 to 136 called the Bar Kokhba uprising. That Eusebius knows about. He talked about that. And this means son of the star. Kokhba star. So he's also, that's not his real name. He's taken that name. So he's evoking the star prophecy in his name. The last uprising in Palestine is another star uprising. So as we pacify this in the Christian scripture to the star over Bethlehem and Magi coming from the east and things like that being led by the star to the manger or to the house where Jesus lived or whatever, uh, the star prophecy moves over into Western literature as a much more uh, congenial pleasant sort of uh, mythological scene. Uh, I've seen the Roman catacombs, the Christian catacombs in Rome. Uh, and the, uh, they have um, several ones I've put in my book, and James, you'll see pictures of them. They have Balaam pointing at the star over their grave. So they know about Balaam was the prophet in the Old Testament who supposedly gave the star prophecy. They know that the star prophecy relates to the Christian scripture too. So 
Eusebius talks about the star, and that's my lecture on the star. The star prophecy was strong in this period, influencing actions. Josephus says that the revolutionary young men had the interpretation wrong. They thought it applied to one of their own. Josephus, as usual, the apple polisher, the sycophant, he says it applied to who? Vespasian, the Roman general who was going to destroy Jerusalem together with his son Titus, who was elevated in Palestine by his army to rule the world. He said they were mistaken in their interpretation of this prophecy. Uh, it actually applied to the Roman general who destroyed Jerusalem. <laughs> And he thinks that's going to fly among the people in Palestine. He has taken the most precious prophecy of the Jewish people at that time, clearly that's what they cared the most about, and said that, oh, you, you guys were wrong about this. You're so stupid. It actually applied to the Roman general who destroyed you, destroyed your temple, and, des and destroyed your holy city. Wow. That is a reversal of all reversals. It's no wonder Josephus was adopted into the Roman imperial family. He was. It meant you got a pension for life and you could go about continuing this propaganda activity that he did. And that's why he's called, as I told you, Flavius Josephus. So the star prophecy was applied by Josephus to this family, their rise. That's how he got his position. Now Christian documents, I think, go back to the native Jewish position. Yes, yes, it's one of the Jews' own. That's who the star is. It is one of their own, but it's someone who thinks in a more cosmopolitan manner. It's someone who's uh, not preaching revolution against Rome, accepts the Roman cultural order, has a lot of problems with his own people, and in fact likes Roman centurions, likes Roman soldiers, likes Roman tax collectors, doesn't mind people with bad sexual habits, prostitutes, uh, is willing to keep company with sinners, and so on. And that's basically what the Gospels are presenting. A Messiah, and say, well, that's him, isn't it? Well, that's what you'll have to determine. Is that a Palestinian person? You'll have to determine. I don't personally think it is, as you see. I do think it's someone like Jesus existed, but I don't think that's a portrayal of him. That's accurate in terms of Palestinian history. I don't know why he was executed by Rome, but I assume if he was executed in the manner that he was executed, it had to do with some kind of subversive revolutionary activity. The Romans didn't make mistakes. And they were very, kept very careful records. And their governors had to repress any kind of revolutionary activity that was inimical to Rome of the Spartacus variety. And they had enough trouble with Spartacus in the previous century to know what was expected of them. And that's why they crucified these people in the droves. And crucifixion was a punishment reserved for people, an exemplary punishment having to do with subversive revolutionary uh, activity or anti-social or revolutionary activity of some kind. So uh, you, you, you have to understand that uh, those are the factors that I would bring into play to try to reconstruct who Jesus was. Okay, let's get on here. Chapter 5, we looked at. We talked about Judas the Galilean. Let me finish up the idea that uh, the, uh, the star for Christianity goes back to the Jewish thing, but it presents a Messiah that may not be familiar to the, in a Palestinian framework. It certainly isn't anything like what the scrolls were in, in, envisioning. Uh, finishing up, the Jesus of Scripture looks a lot like Paul wants him to look like. And yet Paul is an enemy of the early Christian church. So something is odd here. So, okay, we have Judas the Galilean. He starts the sect of the Galileans, though he's not from Galilee. He's from a Golanite. And you see, he um, Josephus calls things from or rather, Eusebius calls important passages from Josephus. All right, we've got that far. So now we know that uh, Judas the Gaulonite came from a town, he says, called Gamala. Where's Gamala? It's in the Golan Heights. It's across the Sea of Galilee, above the Sea of Galilee. Josephus writes about it. Why does he write about it? Why does Josephus write about Gamala? Well, he writes about the Roman siege of Gamala. When the Roman troops came to suppress the uprising in Palestine, they came down from uh, the north, Lebanon, the Lebanese coast, Syrian Lebanon. And they marched down first through Galilee and then down toward Jerusalem. So they, um, Josephus claims that he was the commander in Galilee, Josephus. 
what he was good at was writing books, and that's basically what he ended up doing. That's what he should have done from the beginning. But somehow he saw himself as a military commander, which is preposterous. And uh, he's responsible, he claims, for the defense of Galilee. Well, one of the cities he's supposedly is helping to defend is not in Galilee, it's in the Golan, it's Gamala. The Romans uh, uh, invest that around 67 AD, and all the people jump off the cliffs there and commit suicide rather than surrender. So it's a real hotbed of uh, revolutionary uh, resistance, even in Josephus' time. It looked like a camel's hump. That's why it was called Gamala. Anyway, so he came from there. So he was a Gaul in it. And together with a person called Saduk, or Saducus. You see, you could say the word Sadducee comes from Saduk. He headed a revolt saying that it would be manifest slavery to pay taxes to Rome. So this revolution that had to do with the census that was imposed on the Jews in 6 to 7 AD is the beginning of the movement of Judas the Galilean, which Josephus calls the fourth philosophy that never tells us what it is, which are, I think, pseudo-Christians, but Christians of a more violent strain, uh, the mindset of a Judas the Galilean. Jesus' family may have been descendants of Judas the Galilean, because actually, uh, Judas the Galilean is clearly making Davidic claims of some kind. Uh, Jesus' family, as the scripture presents them, is making Davidic claims. Scripture is presenting Jesus as the star that comes out of Palestine. We're going back to the actual, uh, so he, he, he's like the messianic uh, movement. As Josephus says, the people that made the war against Rome thought that the, that the prophecy applied to one of their own. So I think that the people writing the scripture know that and are basically recasting it in terms of not a war against Rome, but a much more spiritual. We're gonna to try to uh, pick up the page here a bit. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. We're dealing with the Herodian genealogy, if I can find it. Uh, that was, um, chapter 6. Herod was the first foreigner that obtained the government of the Jews. That, as I said, should be read in every theology class. Theology 101, but um, I'll give, I'll give uh, Eusebius a huge amount of credit for that. Um, and also his uh, attempt to give us the background of uh, Herod. And also his notes about the fact that um, Herod uh, changed the political structure and no longer uh, appointed priests from the ancient uh, lineage. So if people want to know when the situation changed in Israel, Palestine, today, whatever you want to call it, Holy Land, this is the moment things changed. But this, if you're working from a New Testament perspective, is the new situation that the New Testament is presenting as the normal situation. It is not the normal situation. So uh, that's what's so important. And he imposed this by confiscating the high priestly vestments. And you say, well, why didn't they just knit some new ones? Well, I don't know why they didn't do that, but uh, they felt these were holy vestments. Uh, confiscating them and keeping them under his seal and only giving them to the person that he was prepared to appoint to do the uh, high priestly uh, duties. So previously we had the Maccabean family doing the high priestly duties. So this is definitely a huge change and uh, more like the picture in the Gospels of high priests, plural, chief priests, plural different clans competing to control the high priesthood, but that was not the situation before 37 BC. Now the genealogy of Christ set, and uh, he shows the two different genealogies here. Uh, but um, if you look at the two versions of the genealogies of Jesus, one in the Gospel of um, Matthew and the other in the Gospel of Luke, I think. You will find that they don't agree. And uh, therefore, you say, which is the true genealogy? Well, if two things don't agree with each other, basically you have to set them both aside to even get a real one because you don't know which is the accurate. If either is accurate. 
but those two genealogies. Um, if I had a, a harmony of the gospel here, I would be able to show you. Uh, in any case, the explanation that this is the father's and that's the mother's wouldn't help either because Jesus' father isn't supposed to be his father. So how's that going to help anything? Uh, so, in fact, that really, uh, that really doesn't prove anything either. But uh, the main point is that Mark and Luke don't agree in their genealogy. But there is a point at the end of all this. The robbers of Idumea attacking Ascalon on the coast led Antipater away captive together with other booty. And he was the son of one Herod, a minister of the temple. The priest of Antipater was not able to pay the ransom. Antipater was trained, therefore, among the Idumeans. That's why we get the Herodians as Idumeans. And then, so this is his, how this Antipater got important. Uh, he met Hyrcanus, who was the Maccabean person exercising power at that time in the first century BC. He managed to ingratiate himself with him and acted as an intermediary with the Roman forces helped bring Pompey into the country on Hyrcanus' side, brought the Romans into the country. So Herod's family were from the beginning instrumental in bringing the Romans into Palestine. They probably would have come anyway, but they used that to further their own political ambitions. So right again from the start, Herod's family, his father, uh, was a Roman um, operative. So any idea that Herod is not in league with the Roman authorities is just nonsense. There from the get-go, and they originally, you see, Antipater, and this is in Josephus, had the good fortune to be nominated procurator of Palestine. Uh, and then ultimately, Herod, by decree of the Senate, in Antony and Augustus' time, through manipulations that I told you a little bit about. And this is a, he's just covered here a 40 year period. Herod doesn't get to be a king under the sponsorship of the Roman Senate until the 30s BC. And his father is operating before Pompey's assault on Jerusalem, 63 BC. But if you want to go into more detail, pick your Josephus up and read it you'll get the history more uh, in more detail. So, King of the Jews was an actual title. It was an occupation title. The Jews being a foreign people, you say, well, what do you mean the Romans had kings? Yeah, well, the Romans had a different government for the peoples in the East. People in Italy, Gaul, and so on, they were brought in under direct Roman rule as Roman citizens to some extent, at least the upper classes. I don't know how the whole slave and other classes work out. And uh, they weren't allowed to have local rulers like kings. The Herodians also had a few kingships in Asia Minor. And then Assyria, and then Palestine, and Transjordan. They were all petty kings in these places. So there's actually an expression in Roman jurisprudence for this. The kings of the peoples. The peoples, the ethnon, being the actual word in Latin, or Greek rather, the gentium is Latin, the ethnon, where we get the word ethnic from, king, that's plural for peoples. That was a term for the rulers of the east. The Herodians would have been one of the kings of the peoples. Now, that seems like nothing, but those people who do Dead Sea Scroll research Kings of the peoples is actually a term used in the Damascus document to describe a situation that they are not happy with in that document. And they're opposing the kings of the peoples. So I think that's another internal indicator that the Damascus document has to do with the Roman administrative period. Because uh, these kings of the peoples. Now, something that is a little bit confusing in that, it calls them uh, Greek kings. But I think what is really meant there is Greek-speaking kings. And Josephus writes in Greek. Greek was a lingua franca of, uh, of much of the empire, particularly anything east of, uh, of Italy proper. So these are Greek-speaking kings in the east. And 
I think that is, oh, they're Greek kings, and that means it's the Seleucid period or the Syrian period, the Alexander the Great period previously. I don't think that that is, uh, it is, uh, is it bears out. I don't think they called them kings of the peoples earlier. In any case, Herod and others were one of these kings, and the king of the Jews is a title. And again, that's not understood, that a, um, a king in Palestine didn't have to be a Jewish king as such. At least not a native-born Jewish king. Now, if you look at the Herodians, look like they're fomenting revolution in some, at some points. Not Herod, although he has ambition. Some of his children, grandchildren, uh, particularly uh, uh, one of the kings that appears in these narratives, uh, uh, Agrippa I. Agrippa I looks like he had ambitions to a, uh, a bigger kingdom. Uh, when the Roman Empire was uh, involved in civil strife and other problematic things, and the succession wasn't terribly secure, and there were problems over different emperors' behavior, and there's some uh, question about the circumstances of his death. It has a lot to do with Christian origins, because the circumstances of his death are also described in Acts. And um, they're not exactly like Josephus describes them, but it's a good um, dating point for Acts to see Acts obviously is trying to describe Agrippa I's death when it talks about Herod posturing and suddenly his stomach being eaten up by worms or something in uh, I think it's around Acts uh, 13 I forget he's dressed like the sun or something he, he's in the, doing something and even though Agrippa I is portrayed as a friend of the of the Roman emperors and he's a grandson of Herod but he has Maccabean blood in him He's a grandson through Herod's wife, Mariam, Miriam. But, but his father was executed by Herod, if you read uh, Josephus, because Herod was afraid his Maccabean offspring. He had one Maccabean wife, the last Maccabean princess, was an enforced marriage. He killed her, too, because he was jealous of her. He killed her husband. I mean, he killed her brother, because he realized the people preferred the brother to Herod. He killed anyone that was in his way. And he basically exterminated the Maccabean family, including his own offspring by the Maccabean family, and his own wife, his own Maccabean wife, who he supposedly cared for. This was a terrible thing for the Jews, if you like, because it really exterminated their royal family that had taken a century or two to develop. And all their hopes were shattered as a nation by this. So when I hear people say, oh, Herod is a Jewish king, this kid is not a Jewish king. This is an interloper. This is someone that the people hated. This is someone who destroyed Jewish nationality, who destroyed the country, who, uh, who, who set the stage for everything that followed since. In fact, he set the stage for the Holocaust. Because uh, by doing the things he did, he set the people you know, on the road away from their native land and their native dynasty, and therefore all the things that happened in the so-called diaspora occurred. Um, so Antipater was nominated procurator, then appointed king, Herod appointed king by the Romans. But since the uh, lineages of the Jews, the genealogies, contributed nothing to his advantage, he was goaded because of his lowly, ignoble extraction, you know, ignoble roots if you not to burn all these records. So because he couldn't have a good genealogy, he burned everyone else's. He's quite smart here, Eusebius, where he's getting this information. Thinking himself might appear of noble origin by the fact that no one else will be able to trace the pedigree by the public records back to the patriarchs or the proselytes and to those strangers that were called Giori. Giori. He means ger. In Hebrew, a ger is somebody, G-E-R, who is a, is in the Bible, they, they're, they're uh, Ger Nilve, they're called. It's referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls, resident aliens. But he burned all those records too. But some people were able to keep their genealogical records, and in particular, this group of people he refers to here as the Disposity. Disposity. And they are uh, the family of Jesus. And, uh, and he says that they still preserve their genealogical records. And he says, too, that they came from two villages, one Nazareth and the other Kokhava. 
So, two villages. Now, I don't know if you've got this right, because these are two messianic type names. Nazara, Nazarene, Nazarene, and so on. Kohava is star. So it's, Nazara often means plant or root. So it's plant village, star village. I'm not sure that uh, we can say there were two villages in Judea, he says, these were called. The, the, these were. So the families of Jesus came from these villages, Nazareth and Kohava, which have messianic sounding names. Uh, but it is, uh, and they uh, took these genealogies to all parts of the world. Where is he getting this from? He says on the bottom of that section, thus far Africanus. Um, so uh, they, they, they followed these genealogies uh, and daily uh, records as, uh, as close as they could. And the genealogies are uncertain, he says, because Herod burned them all. Normally we don't think of Jesus' family. So now, and we hear they come from Nazareth and Kohar. Uh, so Kohava seems to have been at a place near where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Um, down by Jericho, we, we, there was a place, I think, called Kohava. I think that's probably the one he's talking about. And they say Bar Kokhba came from there which is why he was also called Bar Kokhba, because he came from Kohava, which would say that Bar Kokhba is, is a relative of the Jesus family, possibly, too. So if we are really talking about such a town, now who was Bar Kokhba? We mentioned him uh, last time. Let's just review who he was again. He was the person who, who, who led the son of the star again in uh, 132 to 136, the second Jewish uprising. And he was later either taken to Rome as captive and killed or killed in the fighting. I think he was killed in the fighting uh, at, about, at a, uh, a town outside of Bethlehem. I think it was called Batar. Uh, this battle where Bar Kokhba was defeated by Hadrian's forces. Hadrian brought the general in from Britain called Severus or something. Like that. So uh, Bar Kokhba, well, it's a very serious uprising, but we don't have a Josephus to document it, so we don't know we don't know it as intimately as we know the first uprising. But its end was more even devastating than the first uprising because it was after that that Jewish life in Palestine became untenable. So two successive ways of uprising, and I assume they were popular because the people participated in them. So people say the Pharisees again were the popular part. I don't think that they have that right. Okay, more from the antiquities, Herod's cruelty here. He gets the Malachi story from the, from the Gospels mixed with the story of Herod's death. He wants to show that Herod was cruel enough to have done what the Gospels say he did, at least Matthew says, that he was anxious to kill all the Jewish children, not all of them, but in this location because the Malachi had in the Gospel of uh, Matthew said that uh, they would supplant Herod, a man would be born and would supplant him. The point being is that he's saying that, yeah, you see how cruel Herod was here when he's about to die. He had all these notables arrested, put into a, a stadium and told his son that at his death to kill them all uh, so that they would be weeping for him at his funeral because he knew no one else was going to weep for him. But the fact that he compares the two uh, I think it shows that he's aware that this illustrates the kind of thing Herod would do. And um, I think Herod did do the thing about telling his successor to kill all these notables, but I don't think he did the first thing. Now, telling his successor to kill all of the nobles, did the successor kill all the notables? No, because he knew that would be a ridiculous thing. He just let them go. Okay, now we skipped 30 years here, and that's the problem in Josephus too. Josephus has a real blank in his writings from the time of Herod's death and the struggles up to the Roman census to the time of um, the events maybe around 30 or 40 AD, more like 35 and 40, he comes back online. The reason is Herod, uh, Josephus is working from sources for all things up to the time of Herod's period and shortly thereafter. And his sources ran out at that point. 
and, and, and like any writer, he's cribbing from sources. And one fellow particularly was an Herodian diplomat called Nicolaus of Damascus. And I assume that guy's history only went up to the point that he knew, which would be around the time of the death of Herod and shortly thereafter, and there was nothing further. Josephus hadn't been born yet. Josephus wasn't born until 37 or 38. So he was only born in the late 30s, so he doesn't know any events before him except on the basis of sources, and his sources tried up. Uh, and that's why Eusebius doesn't have very much in between. Uh, so, from around the time of 40 AD, Josephus is, uh, is giving you material from almost his own eyewitness account. And certainly from the mid-50s, it's his own eyewitness account. So, uh, but I think anything from the 40s onwards or late 30s, he's not working necessarily off sources. He's using his own, uh, using his own uh, testimony. Now, as far as Pilate is concerned, the government went to uh, one of Herod's sons called Archelaus, chapter 9. Uh, but Archelaus didn't last long because of this unrest during his period. And in 7 AD, with the census 6 to 7, the Romans removed him and put a direct Roman governor here. And there's no longer any Jewish or quasi Jewish, pseudo Jewish king, Herodian Jewish king. Not until Agrippa won. And that's 30 years later. Agrippa won is the son of one of these sons of Herod, who Herod executed, it's all in Josephus, but he had been sent to Rome to be educated like many of these noble families were. Caesar family liked to bring the kings along with them so they could uh, keep company with them and also uh, assimilate them. He was brought up with the people who later became the Roman emperors, Caligula and uh, Claudius. And uh, they were his friends. Anyway, he skips up to Pilate, which is in the 12th year of the reign of uh, Tiberius. Pontius Pilate was appointed a uh, procurator in Judea and remained for 10 years to the death. Now that means Pontius Pilate came in 26 or so and stayed till 37 or so. But this is an important note here. Here you see this shows what's bothering him and his stripes. Hence the fraud of persons is plainly proven who lately and at other times have tried to give currency to certain spurious acts against our Savior. The date shows the falsehood of these inventors. Now this is important. Someone in his time, the 300s, was circulating material from the chancellery records supposedly based on the actual records of Pontius Pilate, the Acti Pilati. He's saying people are trying to discredit the gospel poor picture by circulating these acts, which are supposedly based on the official chan chancellery records of Pilate's ad administration. I would take them a little more seriously than he does, because we don't know that Pilate came in 26. Josephus doesn't know it either. He wasn't born then. He assumes that. Pilate seems to be a very powerful governor. He may have been there uh, 10 years more longer than, than we're talking about here. We don't have the uh, good records for the period of the you know 10 to 30 AD, which is really frustrating because we don't have a good Josephus for this period. Josephus is uh, eternally is totally sketchy in this period. And I would say, suppose in fact a messianic event did occur in 21 AD and not in 30 AD, let's say, or even earlier, 17 or 18 or 19. That makes a lot of sense to me for two reasons. One, someone like Paul, who's on the scene in the 30s. Now, Jesus' execution had occurred in his own lifetime when he was a functioning, mature person, and he was around. Uh, he should have been one of the witnesses to these things. So I have a feeling that Jesus must have, if we can speak about Jesus, come a lot earlier than that, because Paul talks about him like he's ancient history. You look at Paul's letters and you'll find he never says anything about Jesus. Only the supernatural Christ, he has visions of him. He never says anything about the struggle of Christ, except for his picture. So uh, that makes me think he didn't know a lot about Christ. And therefore that Christ wasn't very familiar in his lifetime. And uh, I think the 21 date would, uh, would explain that. 
or even an early one, 16 or if, depending on when Pilate came to pass. Okay, now John the Baptist. So this, now we're getting into the scripture. He's brought us up to the scripture. So John the Baptist period, he's in real problems here because Josephus' account of John the Baptist, which we get in the antiquities, unfortunately does not agree again with the gospel account. Uh, he was beheaded by Herod the Younger. In fact, he's beheaded by a person called Herod the Tetrarch. Meaning he ruled fourth. He was only, uh, or Herod Antipas was his name. Antipas probably after his great grandfather Antipater. Antipas being a version of that name Antipater earlier. Now Herod had many wives, so you know, there's all kinds of offspring. Josephus tells us again, talking about Herodias and how she had married this Herod, though she was the wife of his brother Herod. Well, that doesn't help us any. These not people who had other names, not just Herod is more of a title. Herodias' husband, first husband, is in fact called Herod as his name. He's Herod Herod. In other words, he's named after his father. Now, he is the one who uh, either divorces or dies childless or whatever we're talking about here. But uh, the other Herod, Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, takes Herodias away from him. Now, in the Gospels, she's, he's called Philip. He's called Philip. The one who is married to Herodias is Philip. I, I know I'm confusing you. That's because the Gospels don't have the right names. You say, well, how can they be wrong? Because they just were sloppy. People writing them were overseas. They didn't really care that much about the history. They were just, you know, putting it together in their own way, oral tradition, or from sources, or whatever they were doing. I would, but you can, you can decide on that yourself. Philip was Herodias' daughter's husband. And Philip was Salome's husband. Now, why do I rely on Josephus better than the Gospels in this? Because the Gospels don't even know the name of Herodias' daughter. They have a daughter of Herodias dancing on a table or whatever it is, dancing in the seven veils, or whatever that legend is, in order to beguile Herod. Everyone's called Herod. This is confusing here. Uh, in order to beguile Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, that because John was objecting to this marriage and that was her mother's marriage and uh, according to uh, the, the way the Gospels presented Herod didn't want to execute Jesus but this sexy girl uh, wanted John's head on a platter I don't think it happened that way uh, there's no story in Josephus about his head on a platter but there is something about a platter in Josephus' story about about this is really complicated. Uh, when Nero married this one woman, she had taken the place of another of his previous wives, who he had had exiled. But she was terribly jealous of her, so she demanded that Nero send him the the head of this, send her the head of this woman on a platter, so she can know that her rival had been killed. Well, so what he's, I think that's really the story of John's head on a lot of platter from things in Rome that were that happened like that, that they were all familiar with horrible things like that that had occurred. Anyway, the Gospels don't know the name of Salome. We have to go to Josephus to know that her name is, is Salome. We also have to go to Josephus to know that her, Salome's husband's name is Philip. Now later on, Salome marries again. She marries another. She marries another Herodian family member, the son of Agrippa I's brother. He's called Herod of Chalcis, and, and he has a son, Aristobulus, and that's her second marriage to Aristobulus, and they get a kingdom together in Asia Minor, and they become the rulers of this kingdom in Asia Minor, and we have coins with their pictures on it. And it says, Aristobulus and Salome, and on the back, great lovers of Caesar. And uh, interestingly enough, 
in the Romans letter that I told you about, where Paul is sending uh, greetings to his kinsmen, he says, send my greetings to all in the household of Aristobulus. Now, Aristobulus is the name of this Salome's uh, 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 um, new husband, also the son of one of the Herodian lines. And then he says in the next line, and send my uh, regards to my kinsman Herodian. Well, they had a son called Herod, and that would be the littlest Herod, Herodian being the littlest Herod. And in my view, that's who he's talking about when he sends those uh, greetings. And that, to me, is the proof that Herod was a cousin or kinsman, of, uh, that Paul was a cousin or kinsman of these people. Now, you can check me out, and uh, it's in the letter to the Romans, and uh, you can decide if that is correct. But that's the story of Salome. Uh, but let us go back to... Um, let us go back to this story of the death of uh, John the Baptist. So he quotes Josephus' story here. He relates that Herod lost his kingdom on account of the same Herodias, that he, that he was driven into exile, that is, this Herod Antipas, and to, had to dwell in Vien, uh, which is on the Rhone River in France, in Gaul. These facts are stated to him in the 18th book of his Antiquities, where in the same paragraph he writes, about John. To some of the Jews, the army of Herod, who was then fighting Aretas, who's the Arab king across the, across the Jordan River. The point was is that um, Herod the Tetrarch had had a previous political marriage to Aretas' daughter, which is, would have been a wise thing for him to have if he was an ambitious uh, governor. And uh, when he saw her Herodias was available to him, he divorced Aretas' daughter and married Herodias. Then apparently Aretas, the Arab king, got angry and declared war against uh, Herod the Tetrarch, who was governor of Galilee and Perea in Transjordan. This is very complicated. But in any case, he's governor of this and this area here. So Aretas is here. He's come up to Damascus, and he's fighting Herod, this Herod, over the fact that he divorced her daughter. All this is in Josephus. So, this is the background. He lost his kingdom on account of Herodias. These facts are stated in the 18th book of the, of the Antiquities. So some of the Jews, the army of Herod, seemed to have been destroyed because Herodias defeated him. Was thus a signal, was a just thing, because it was vengeance for death, the death of John the Baptist. For Herod slew him, though he was a righteous man. And all he did was exhort the Jews to practice a, a virtue or piety or righteousness. And in the pursuit of piety and righteousness towards God to come to baptism. For this baptism appeared to him to be, uh, to be imparted for this object, not with a view to avoid uh, sinfulness, but for the pur purification of the body only, <coughs> because the mind had pur previously been purified by righteousness. Now, that is an incredible description of, uh, description of John's baptism, and it is not the description we get in, in the New Testament. <clears throat> what he's saying there is you first must practice righteousness and then in the Jewish way you go to immersion to get rid of your bodily uh, impurities. And so <coughs> uh, this immersion was a bodily purification only. The soul had to be purified beforehand by righteousness. And many flocked to him and delighted in his discourse. He was a popular leader, I agree. Herod dreaded the confidence everyone had in him. He feared that this confidence would lead him to propose a revolt, for they seemed to be, the Jews were, dispo, were, were disposed to do anything he might su su suggest. So, before any such uh, revolution or political change uh, brought on by this influence John had over the mass occurred, he thought that if he destroyed him before this happened, uh, he would not have to repent of it later. Well, that is a totally different story than, than the New Testament. The New Testament is a silly girl who, who, who wasn't even, in fact, uh, named and wasn't even, in fact, um, she was married to actually the person the mom was supposed to be married to, danced a sexy dance, and then Herod wasn't responsible for his actions because he liked John, and he thought John was a, a righteous man. Uh, Josephus says just the opposite. John was a popular leader. He was recognized across the mass board. Uh, the rulers were let me finish. The rulers were afraid of him, 
And because they were so afraid of the influence he had over the mass, they thought he would lead a, re a revolt of some kind, and they thought that they should have a preventive execution to avoid that possibility, lest they should regret being caught. So which of the two stories do you feel more historically reliable? Anyway, that's from, you see, I've gotten to the point that I don't believe anything anymore. <laughs> so I've gotten really, uh, really cynical, I'm afraid. And, uh, uh, let's see. So we were trying to move along in this uh, presentation here, and um, we had this thing about Herod burning all the records and the disposity, the people from the family of Jesus that we... You see, the problem with there being a family of Jesus is that... Um, it kind of undercuts the supernatural Christ issue. And the people who are into Jesus as a supernatural God, being, person, whatever, as the theology developed in the second and third century, particularly the second century, were not happy with the family people who uh, were claiming, you know, um, physical relationships. Now, particularly if the relationship is on the father's side, in what way are they a member of the family, you see? They're not in um, theological terms for people who uh, go according to the idea of divine sonship and so on. So these, these uh, presentations clashed and uh, the supernatural Christ won out by the time of Eusebius. As you see, he's totally uh, addicted to the supernatural Christ. And uh, the family person advanced beyond other men simply by his practice of righteousness, uh, took second place and fell back, and over time almost totally disappeared in favor of, well, it's really Paul that presents Jesus as a supernatural being. And I don't know, you say, well, the apostles did too. Well, no, we don't really have the writings of the apostles that we can rely on, that we can be uh, comfortable with, that they're authentic. So we don't know what the people around him thought. And we certainly, um, if James, in my book, I try to say, once you found the historical James, you found the historical Christ. And I meant by that, that uh, if James, who was uh, closest to him family-wise, spent his whole life with him, went around with him, if you like. So what I meant by the statement that you, uh, I, I don't think a person who spent his whole life with him and uh, succeeded him and so on, uh, well, could have been mistaken about his doctrine. These guys knew him and succeeded him. And, and they didn't have any illusions. Some other person um, could come up and say, well, I believe in the divine John Kennedy, and these, uh, these family members of Kennedy got it all wrong. And in the course of time, that person can overwhelm them with his literary uh, ability and acumen and uh, um, uh, public relations skills. And therefore, it can turn out that his approach becomes the favorite approach. But that doesn't mean it's the accurate approach. So I thought that, that the, to my mind, Paul did that, and he won out, actually. I'm sure everyone in his time were laughing at him. And, uh, considered him uh, in a very negative way, uh, and yet too, because he was so effective in his writings, he came to dominate, uh, dominate the tradition that we now all um, uh, feel um, familiar and close and uh, affectionate towards. And the others, who uh, may have uh, been laughing at him at that time, have gone into uh, basically the trash heap of history. Okay, now, uh, we were talking about the John the Baptist situation and the testimonies regarding John the Baptist when we, uh, when we finished up last time. And um, here Eusebius is kind to us. He does give the counter-indicating material from Josephus uh, that would actually uh, conflict with the Gospels. This is from the Antiquities, and you're now familiar with the fact there are two works of Josephus that have survived, correct? one called the War, and one called the Antiquities, and they were written at different times. When was the War written? 
were right after the war was fought. Some of the, the war was fought between 66 and 70. Masada fell in 73. Holdouts on Masada were the last to fall. Uh, the Romans uh, surrounded the place, starved it out, built ramps, and uh, ultimately invested it. After them, and everyone committed suicide there, as was the style of the uh, extreme resistors known as the Sicarii. Because of the knife they supposedly hid beneath their garments to assassinate their opponents. And I don't think that they in fact call themselves that name because that would be very pejorative. In other words, someone's calling them knife people. I don't think they, we, they call themselves the knife people. And the closest word to this that we've been able to find is this. In fact, we put the eye reverse this, that's often done, it's even closer. And uh, in Greek, this would be Sikarios, so it gets even closer. Uh, is Judas supposed to, and the uh, Sikari, you have to, if you've read it, just see if it's carefully, was founded by a person called Judas. I think that the character in the Gospels is meant to caricature Judas. Founded the Sicarii movement. Do you think the Sicarii were the ones that were after Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, the Sicarii were after Paul, and that's why he hates them so much. It turns out there's another version of Josephus in an early church father that's mentioned here by uh, Eusebius. He was in the 200s in Rome, and he wrote a, a book on the heresies, and that book exists. But we're not sure if he really wrote it, but it's attributed to him. And he has a section on the Essenes, and he says there are four groups of Essenes, two of which are called Zealot Essenes and Sicari Essenes. And he doesn't distinguish between the two, these two groups. And I feel that his insight into this period is actually better than the conventional Josephus, and that explains a lot that the Sicari Essenes were the Essenes willing to use violence. And uh, there are peaceful Essenes and there are warlike Essenes. And the warlike Essenes are responsible, in my view, for the Dead Sea Scrolls, because the Dead Sea Scrolls, whatever they are, are not peaceful. And therefore, people who think the peaceful Essenes could have written the Dead Sea Scrolls have to do a huge jump in order to try to, to say everything violent that they were talking about was only symbolic violence. And Josephus even admits, if we look at his war carefully, that the Essenes participated in the war against Rome and that they were, uh, one person is known, a person called John the Essie, as a, as a military commander of the, uh, in the uprising. And uh, how John the Essene differs from John the Christian, I would, would like to be, uh, that to be explained to me, honestly. And um, uh, uh, so Josephus tells us, even in the normative Josephus, that they participated in the uprising and that they uh, were admired for the death that they were willing to die and uh, that you could torture them and do them all kinds of things to them which the Romans did and they would not blaspheme the creator as Josephus puts it or willing to eat forbidden food so they were certainly uh, were not like the New Testament presents things in terms of um, dietary regulations not being enforced so much were they enforced that these people were willing to go to the death rather than eat forbidden foods like pork or stuff like that so um, these uh, Sicari Essenes, uh, as Hippolytus calls them, are the extreme Essenes. And uh, he says there are different groups of Essenes. And uh, I think that that's accurate. And uh, that helps. And all scholars work in this field never even look at Hipp Hippolytus. I've never met one scholar. I don't know, you've looked at books, I know. I don't think you've ever, one scholar who even refers to Hippolytus. Uh, I, I, I don't think you will find it, Liam. Uh, in fact, Hippolytus says, that these Sicarii Essenes would go so far that if they heard someone discussing the law who was not circumcised, they would give them the choice of circumcision or death. Um, in any case, here we have a testimony to John the Baptist, different from the one in Scripture, that uh, Eusebius is kind enough to, uh, uh, to uh, provide us. It doesn't matter, it's in the Josephus. Now, we took the two versions of Josephus. One is in after the war, 73 or thereabouts, 74, 75, right? He's got the Roman triumph in the uh, Jewish war and about Titus bringing the captives to Rome and all the uh, spoils from the temple and the candelabra from the temple 
and so on. Uh, the Antiquities is written 20 years later, 93. We know it was published in 93. So by 93, Josephus is feeling more secure, more comfortable. He's been in Rome for 20 years. He's more forthcoming. He says things in the Antiquities he's not prepared to say in the war. He's more forthcoming about the Zealot movement he's, that caused the war against Rome. He's more forthcoming about Judas the Galilean. He identifies people with Judas the Galilean who founded the Zadok movement, supposedly, uh, called one person called Zadok, or Zadok. He doesn't talk much about it, but he brings him. And he, he mentions characters called Theudas, who we didn't mention earlier. He mentions James, the brother of Jesus, who we didn't mention earlier. Um, he also mentions John the Baptist, whom we didn't mention earlier. So he's got a lot of extra material in the... Uh, in the antiquities they didn't have in the Jewish. So here it is. Uh, Herod lost his kingdom, the Jews thought, <coughs> because of what he did to John the Baptist, or at least the war that was fought after uh, John the Baptist. He fought a war with the Arabian king Aretas. He mentions him at the beginning. And he says, he divorced his former wife, uh, who was the daughter of Aretas, king of Arabia. You see that? It's in chapter 11. Um, who is this Herod? Herod Antipas. That's his real name. Named after Herod's father, obviously, Antipater. Or also called at one point in the Gospels and in Josephus, I think, as well. And in the Book of Acts, anyway, he certainly called this the Book of Acts, Herod the Tetrarch. He had the two provinces of Galilee and Perea. He didn't have Jerusalem. Now, in the Gospels, certainly in Luke, anyway, who shows a lot of knowledge of Josephus, there's an interview uh, that uh, Herod has with Jesus. It's not in the other Gospels. Because, again, Luke likes to show off his knowledge of Josephus, and he knows there was a Herod that, that was involved in affairs then. But you see, Herod didn't have responsibility for Jerusalem, that Herod. His responsibility was Galilee. Some of the Jews, the army of Herod, seemed to have been destroyed by God. That is because the Herod lost this battle with Aretas, who was angry about what he did to his daughter. And this is Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch. For Herod had slew, slew, slain John the Baptist. This was vengeance for John. So the Jews are for John, and they take and they and they like the fact that Herod has had vengeance inflicted on him for what he did to um, John. So that's right out right. John is supported by. So we had a discussion here the other day about whether I don't know if I brought my gospels this time, but I think uh, I think I did. I think I did. I think I did. Up oh, no, didn't. I uh, had the harmony where I want to show the different presentations of the scribes and Pharisees coming down to harass John. One of the Gospels has him uh, attacking not just the scribes and Pharisees, but the whole Jewish people at that point. Uh, others just have him attacking the scribes and Pharisees. So we have to look at the different Gospels. I don't have time to go through them all with you. But you can check that out, look at the different Gospel presentations of that. Well, even the scripture doesn't claim that John taught Holy Spirit baptism. They say Jesus taught Holy Spirit baptism. Paul teaches Holy Spirit baptism. Acts says, when Paul is in Ephesus, which is on the coast of Asia Minor, that he meets someone who only knows John's baptism, which was a water baptism only. I think that's accurate. I think that uh, Paul is the one who's teaching Holy Spirit baptism. I don't know if Jesus taught Holy Spirit baptism. Again, we don't have any authentic documents from Jesus directly. We have documents about Jesus. Now, if you read the community rule in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's exactly what you have to do. There is water baptism in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's an immersion in streams, rivers, and so on. And the whole thing is that you have to purify the soul before and by the practice of righteousness. And so uh, the, the scroll groups were daily bathers, in fact. Uh, these, to me, are all John the Baptist-type groups whether John came out of them, or taught them, or was part of them. And when others flocked to him, for they really enjoyed his discourse, meaning Jewish people heard his discourses, Herod was worried about 
how much he was admired of people who felt confident in him, that he might be moved to encourage them to revolt, where they were disposed to do anything he might suggest. So he had a total control over the, over the masses, at least, of the people who were interested in him. And so he considered it would be better before such a revolt occurred to anticipate such a thing by destroying him rather than wait till after the revolt or uprising had occurred and uh, all the difficulties that would ensue from that and repent of not having killed him, repent of having spared him afterwards. It's very convoluted, I admit, but that's what Josephus says. That is not the picture in, in the New Testament. Anyone disagree that that is not? I don't care which picture you like, but the two pictures are not the same. Herod removes John the Baptist because he considers him a threat and a potential um, uh, revolutionary, uh, and that the people are would be prepared to do what he suggested, and therefore he kills him. Uh, preventive execution, we call it. In consequence of Herod's suspicions, therefore. He was sent in bonds to the aforesaid prison Macaros. That's not in the Gospels, because the Gospels don't know this kind of detail. They don't know Macaros. They don't know these things. And there he was executed. Uh, so then he gives a testimony about Christ here, which most people think is interpolated. Uh, that is too orthodox. They feel that the testimony about Jesus that he mentions here, that's also in the Antiquities, when he says this was the Christ, shows a later theological hand at work that Josephus would not have acknowledged anyone as the Christ at that point in time. Now he might have been, he might have. Uh, the, the Pilate inflicted the punishment of the cross on him after the eyes accusation for a principal man. It's all perfectly in, in, in harmony with the scripture as we know it. Those who have been attached to him before did not however afterwards cease to love him for he appeared to them alive again. So we have all this about the appearances in the Gospels on the third day, according to the Holy Prophet. So this is a Orthodox <coughs> Christian writing. Uh, now, maybe in fact, uh, Josephus was an Orthodox Christian. I don't know. Uh, the race of Christians who derive their name from him likewise still continues to this day. But I don't know if Christians had become a known quantity uh, in the world by 70 AD or thereafter, maybe by 90, yes. Uh, they were they were around, but um, everyone considers this to be an interpolation because of its uh, orthodox content and the way Josephus acknowledges Jesus as the Christ, therefore acknowledging himself to be a Christian. This is really the, um, what a monk would have written, perhaps copying Josephus uh, after a certain amount of time, and this is what's crept in. Now, there's a famous writer, a guy called Robert Eisler. But he tries to uh, reconstruct the Jesus testimony from all other sources. It, he taught me a lot in that I, I, um, I learned that what people did when they interpolated was take out the section and, he, and put in something about the same length in that section. Sort of like they pasted something over it. They didn't recopy the whole manuscript uh, or the uh, piece of the scroll. One last point that I did make before about John is that in the Gospel, and this is not in the Gospel of John. John does not have this material. It's only in what we call the synoptics, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. But where John is concerned, there is one piece of information that is interesting. That is that Josephus tells us that Philip, who is presented in the synoptics as Herodias' original husband, whom she divorced, Josephus makes it quite clear that Philip was not Herodias' husband, but her daughter's husband, which throws the whole gospel presentation into total turmoil. And then people who try to get out of that say, oh, well, there were two Philips. There's no indication to Josephus that there were two Philips. And the whole thing about, the, um, about John's arguments over why he, he had no right to marry his brother's wife. Well, in fact, he would have had right to marry his, his brother's wife according if that wife, husband had been Philip, because Philip died childless. Josephus makes a, a, a point that Philip did die childless, which means that you could. 
the whole thing about Leverite marriage, that is the issue, but that the brother shouldn't die childless. So the wife should be impregnated by someone from the family to give the brother, you know, representation. Well, that's a decent idea from a primitive society in those days. I don't think it had anything to do with the situation, but that's the only thing the writers could come up with. Why was everyone angry at John? Well, if they had the Dead Sea Scrolls, they would have had plenty more to understand what the problem was there. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls come down really very heavily on niece marriage. And both of those husbands of Herodias were marrying their niece. And it also uh, goes down very heavily against divorce. And they call this fornication. So it's, if we say that John and the Dead Sea Scrolls have, uh, are in the same ballpark, on the same wavelength, then we have a lot of additional complaints John could have had against these Herodian family relationships. The Leverite marriage does come into the Talmud, particularly a friend of Josephus that he mentions in his work, also called Jesus, interestingly enough, his best friend, which makes me suspicious of a lot of things, uh, a rabbi called Jesus ben Gamala, uh, who is killed by the Zealots the time of the uprising, at the same time that the murder of James is killed, another high priest called Ananus, and Josephus covers this in the war, the killing of these two priests. One is best friend, and the other, this one responsible for the death of James, because the point was is that this Jesus ben Gamala was going to marry the daughter of a high, another high priest whose husband had died. But she hadn't finished the Leverate marriage period, or whatever it was called, and there was some bribery involved to permit this marriage of Jesus ben Gamala uh, against Leverite marriage provisions. Now it turns out that the other husband of Herodias wasn't called Philip. Uh, Philip. He was actually called, as I told you, but he was Herod Herod. And, and he's not a very important character, but he was her first husband. It's he whom she divorced. And why would she, uh, why was everyone after Herodias? Because as first of all, it turns out that Herodias is the sister of Agrippa I, who is the king I told you about. But he's the grandson through the Maccabean bloodline. And the reason they all want to marry her, because she's carrying the Maccabean bloodline. She's the only one the Romans really recognize as kings. And for instance, when Bernice and Agrippa come and interview Paul after Drusilla and Felix did, they're all brothers and sisters. He doesn't make that clear in Acts. Drusilla is Bernice's sister. Agrippa, too, is Drusilla's brother. None of that is made clear in Acts. And uh, he said, well, so what? It's very important. These people are supporting Paul. And uh, they're rescuing him. And they're saying that, he's, uh, that, he's, that the Jews are being mean to him that um, he hasn't, he's not guilty of any crime. Agrippa II says to him, a little more Paul and I would become a Christian. So all these people are Herodians. Now, read your Josephus and you'll find that the Jews abominated Agrippa II. They liked Agrippa I, but they didn't like Agrippa II. Because Agrippa II, one tried at least to honor the ancestors' traditions, but Agrippa II was just a, a nothing. And uh, they actually stoned him when he came near Jerusalem. And they barred him from the city. And the rumor was that he was having an illicit relationship with his sister Bernice. And none of this, well, of course, the Acts does show him come on the arm of his sister Bernice. But they don't make it clear, and they don't tell us that Bernice is later uh, Titus's mistress, the destroyer of Jerusalem. And that Titus later took Bernice to Rome as his mistress. None of this do we, uh, do we get, that these people are in league with the destructors of Jerusalem, <coughs> that their palaces have all been burned, that, they, uh, that the Jews have barred them from the temple, that their forefathers supposedly built, and so on. None of this is, none of this is, is brought forth. These are just a uh, Drusilla, a Jewish. Well, that, that leaves a lot unsaid. So, do I feel John had reason to object to the Herodians? Yes. Do I think it's about Leverite marriage? No. Do I think that's the picture the New Testament authors give us because they don't know about the other things? Yes. Do I think that they would have understood the other things if they had been presented them? Probably not. But in any case, I think the issues are divorce, 
marriage with a niece, marriage, marrying uncles, and things like that. And the New Testament writers couldn't figure out what John's problems were, except maybe something to do with Levite marriage. They couldn't figure it out. So that's what they put in there. Let's go on to chapter 12. So we have other apostles and disciples, and it's always difficult to figure out the difference between an apostle and disciple, even in the scripture. Sometimes everyone's being called disciples, other times they're being called um, apostles. But as it uh, pans out, according to the way Eusebius now is presenting it to us, there are 70 disciples, though all 70 disciples are never given us, and I doubt if they ever existed. Look at this, though. Sosthenes. And also in St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, Sosthenes, who sent letters with Paul to the Corinthians, is said to have been one of these. Yes, Paul does address Corinthians to, or mention uh, Sosthenes in, I think, Corinthians, since he is at Corinth. But guess what? When the book of Acts comes to write about what happens to Paul at Corinth, Sosthenes is the one who wants to whip him and beat him at the altar. Sosthenes is presented as the leader of the synagogue. So we either have two Sosthenes in, uh, in Corinth, which I doubt, two Jewish people called Sosthenes, or Book of Acts is just too crudely picked up information from Paul and uh, transformed it into something else. I just mentioned this Sosthenes here is now considered even a disciple. In the Book of Acts, he's Paul's enemy. And Thaddeus too. Now, 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 Thaddeus may be an apostle, may be a disciple, or if it's, maybe there's no difference between them. The problem is that if you go to the apostle list, so we, we don't have time to do that probably in this class, I don't have it in front of me, but if I remember correctly, uh, Matthew says uh, Lebeus, who was surnamed Thaddeus, Mark has, doesn't mention a Lebeus, just has Thaddeus as one of the twelve. Lebeus Thaddeus. Uh, and Luke doesn't have Thaddeus. In place of, of Thaddeus, Luke has Judas of James. Judas of James meaning either Judas the son of James or Judas the brother of James. Most people think it's Judas the brother of James. So now we're getting into real problems because Judas the brother of James, if James is the brother of Jesus, then Judas is also the brother of Jesus. So Thaddeus is another person to keep an eye on. Um, we, have, we will have a tale here in Eusebius that Thaddeus goes down to Antioch and is involved in the conversion of this king there. And that Judas Thomas, or Thomas, is involved in it too. And we know from uh, other uh, documents that Thomas is called Judas Thomas. I think it's in the, um, I get it confused sometimes, but certainly in the Gospel of Thomas, he's called the words of Didymus Judas Thomas. Didymus Judas Thomas. The reason, um, I don't know why the Judas drops out in the normative scripture, and Mark and, and John, he's Didymus Thomas. But in fact, uh, John has got to be wrong there, because what we have there is, again, confusion of two languages. Toma in Aramaic is twin, and Didymus in Greek is twin. So basically his name is Twin Twin, the same as Peter's name is Rock Rock. Uh, you know, that's because the writers are a little bit confused with their data and don't know the languages that they might ordinarily know. And when we finally find out who Judas is the twin of, I mean, who, 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 the, who the twin is, that he's Judas the twin, the twin Judas Thomas. And we have a lot of material written in the name of Judas Thomas. Therefore, we have another Judas. Now, how is he different from Judas of James or Thaddeus? I'm not sure he is. Uh, and there's another character that pops up in the Nagamati scrolls called the Udis. And the Udis also pops up in the, uh, in the uh, Josephus materials, particularly in the antiquities, not in the war. And he's a Jesus-like character 
who wants to part the Jordan River in, in reverse, who is beheaded by the Romans. And it turns out that he's beheaded by the Romans around the time that James, the brother of John, is beheaded in the, in the Book of Acts. We have here an extremely interesting uh, event, the conversion of King Agmurus or Abgurus, depending on uh, these uh, Semitic names were often um, um, these were often uh, communicated uh, in confusion. In any case, there's a whole thing of his conversion to Christianity that is given here at the end of Book 1. And the apostles involved, if you notice, are Thomas and Thaddeus. <coughs> and this is also in the city of Edessa. We actually have a letter supposedly written, and another character appears here called Ananias. As we go through this, we find out that in fact Judas is called Thomas, even in this. So we're really getting pretty good historical material there. If you go across uh, the answer of Jesus here to Agabus 45 of my book, I don't know what it is in the Penguin book, but look at this. Judas called Thomas, said Thaddeus the Apostle. So here he is already called Judas Thomas.